Hi and welcome. It's Jessica Drummond here from the Integrative Women's Health Institute. I have some very important content for you today to take back to your practice and make sure that even your patients who look quite healthy on the surface are doing everything that they can to optimize their fertility and their preconception all the way through pregnancy, all the way through postpartum health. So today, our webinar is about the five common preconception mistakes that even your healthy patients are making. Let's jump right into the content. So these are the five mistakes we're going to dig into with some depth. First of all, everyone knows that lowering the toxin load prior to pregnancy is a good idea. We all know about reducing exposures to um, uh, estrogenic environmental toxins, and a lot of our patients have been told that doing a preconception juice fast is the thing to do. Well, I'm here to tell you it is not. Uh, it may be a piece of the puzzle, but it's definitely not going to adequately prepare their bodies for pregnancy and optimize their fertility on its own. So the minimization of endocrine disrupting chemicals and doing, you know, three or five or even seven days of juicing is not the best strategy. And we'll talk about what is. The second mistake is that we really are reluctant to talk about fat loss with our patients who are trying to get pregnant. I know I am. I really don't want to add to that burden of society telling women that they need to lose weight. But I do want to talk to you about why and how that is so important and how to do it in a way that's effective and not just worsening uh, and, and coming at our patients with more body shaming. Also, a lot of our preconception patients and patients who are trying to get pregnant are taking over-the-counter pain relievers for various different reasons. Maybe they've got menstrual headaches. Maybe they're very active and they're taking them for joint and muscle aches and pains. And most women don't know that over-the-counter pain relievers can actually suppress ovulation temporarily, which is a huge problem if they are trying to conceive. Also, we'll be digging into why it's so important to address vaginal flora. Again, most women don't know that optimizing the vaginal flora, which goes right along with optimizing the gut microbiome, is essential for optimal fertility and optimal pregnancy outcomes. Finally, so many of our patients are on birth control pills or have been on birth control pills. 80% of women in the United States alone have been on birth control pills at some point in their lives. And so it is a huge mistake to ignore that, you know, to just come off the pill and try to get pregnant. We have to, there is a transition period that needs to happen because women who have been on birth control pills are very often lacking essential nutrients. They are depleted in essential nutrients. And you need to know what those are as a practitioner. And you need to know how to restore them to optimize pre-pregnancy health. So let's have a little fun today. At the end of this webinar, I will have a special invitation for you. So I want you to stay tuned to the end. There is a lot of content here. And at the end, I will share this really special invitation. And so while we're here, and I'm, I know I'm terrible at this myself, you know, we are often doing a couple of things at the same time. And I've been practicing and practicing. If you've heard any of my lectures on microbalance, you know, I've been practicing and practicing for years. And this is so important to do just one thing at a time. So I strongly encourage you to close all of the other windows that you have open on your computer, silence your cell phone notifications, and find a quiet place so that you can focus on what we're going to discuss today because there is a lot of in-depth evidence-based content in this webinar that I don't want you to miss. So we have to practice, one of, as one of my earliest meditation teachers once said to me, when you are not practicing mindfulness, which is simply paying attention to what you're doing at the time, you are practicing distraction. So while you're with me today, please practice mindfulness. 
Let me tell you a bit about who I am, um, if you don't already know me. So I, my name is Jessica Drummond. I started my career as a physical therapist, and like many physical therapists, especially those of us who were athletes as children and adolescents and young adults, I started my practice in orthopedics and sports medicine. But within about the first three years of my career, I specialized in women's health, which essentially women's health physical therapy is about rehabilitating injuries that occur with female cancer surgeries, birth injuries and birth traumas, uh, you know, just pain during pregnancy, um, things like stress urinary incontinence, fecal incontinence, urge incontinence, pelvic pain, endometriosis, sexual pain. So all of these specifically related conditions to women's health and pelvic health and pelvic floor health. So I did that for more than a decade in a number of major hospitals where we delivered lots and lots of babies and worked with, and I worked with lots and lots of mothers all during the preconception, prenatal, postpartum periods, and learned a lot from that hands-on experience. Then I had my own child. So my oldest daughter was born in 2003. And I, you know, got had an easy time getting pregnant with her. Um, you know, I, I loved being a new mom, but I was exhausted. And actually, that pregnancy and her delivery and birth was a real trigger for me to having a hormonal imbalance big challenge. I got really sick. Um, I had a huge hormonal problem. I had chronic pain. I had burnout. I had constant illness. I had anxiety. And I also had uh, secondary infertility. So about when my oldest was about two, we tried to start having another baby despite the fact that I was feeling really awful, but no one could really point to why that was. I was just, you know, told, oh, you need antidepressants or you just need to take a little more time off, things like that. And none of that helped. Um, eventually, I found a functional medicine practitioner who diagnosed me with adrenal fatigue, which, you know, that was a long time ago now. We now, the, that whole definition has evolved. We realize that adrenal fatigue isn't necessarily a real diagnosis, but it's a piece of the puzzle of an endocrine imbalance or HPA axis dysfunction. So that's a lecture for an entirely another day. But the point is, I learned so much from that personal experience of how bad you can really feel in even in your early 30s when your hormones become out of balance with a pregnancy, with a delivery. And then I did struggle personally for about three years with infertility. So I went back to school because that's what I do. I've been in school for my whole life. Um, I went back to school to become a nutritionist. I, I got a, cert a nutritionist certification, and I'm actually currently uh, almost finished with a doctoral program in clinical nutrition. So I dig deep. When I, when I go for something, I dig deep. And, uh, but personally, that turned out to be one of the best things I could have ever done. So I worked with my functional medicine practitioner who, you know, again, this was back in 2008, 2009. So there were limits to really what we understood at that time. But then I be continued to learn more and more and more and implement it in my own life. And then in 2011, my second daughter, Kate, was born. There she is a few years ago at her third birthday party. And I also started a business baby, right, uh, the Integrative Women's Health Institute, where I felt that it was so essential to bring all of the combination of my physical medicine knowledge with my functional medicine and functional nutrition knowledge to those who are working with women in the preconception, perinatal, postpartum years, women with pelvic pain, and really across the board of women's health issues. We also work with female athletes in my practice and women with perimenopausal struggles, osteoporosis, uh, female cancers. So that's how this all came together to where we are today. So I'm great. To, I'm happy to be meeting you, uh, whether it's the hundredth webinar you've heard of ours or the first. So let's dig into the content here. First of all, mistake number one for all practitioners working, whether you're a 
fitness or wellness professional or a healthcare clinician, the number one mistake for working with women in the preconception period is encouraging them to do an incomplete detoxification program. So as I said, we all know that it's an important goal to reduce the overall toxic load in mothers to prevent and protect their fetuses from complications, reduce her risk as the mother of having postpartum complications like depression, anxiety, or triggering an autoimmune flare, or even the the first time experience of an autoimmune disease. So there are important reasons to do a preconception detox, and, and we generally understand that, but it's how we do the detoxification that is so important. So when we're just recommending things like juice fast, water fast, fast, master cleanses, these strategies, even exercise, even you know sweating strategies like exercise, which are very effective, the problem is that these strategies upregulate phase one of liver de- the liver detoxification pathways while doing nothing to support phase two. So you can actually be kind of pulling stored toxins out of their safe hidden zones and the fat and the bone and mobilizing them and starting the process of detoxification. But the process of detoxification after phase one sometimes makes certain molecules actually more toxic. And then you're you're actually stirring up an excessive toxicity and, and sort of flow, free flowing toxicity in the body. So Upregulating phase two, phase one is not a good idea, especially when you're not at all addressing that patient's exposure to environmental toxins. So we've created at uh, the Integrative Women's Health Institute, we call it IWHI. Here at IWHI, we have created a program to educate practitioners on how to help their patients reduce that toxic load of exposures without freaking them out. Because let's face it, if you're like, you can only eat organic food and you can't have, you know, any exposure to non-organic cosmetics. And what if the air you breathe has too many particles in it? You know, you can really freak your patients out. There's only so much they can do about their environmental toxic load. We live in an environment that has toxins in it. Fortunately, we we have, especially when it's well-supported, detoxification systems that can manage these things to an extent. Now there's, so I've invited Laura Adler to teach on this course because she is a world-renowned expert on safely and without excessive hype, reducing environmental toxic exposures to endocrine disruptors, you know, picking things like very specific water filters for that patient, because this is important in this population. And if you don't know a lot about this, this is something you need to know even more. Because xenobiotics, these environmental toxins, readily cross through the placenta, and they do flow into the fetus. Uh, the fetus. The fetus. The, develop, d- the developing fetus is exposed to the chemicals, the persistent pollutants, and even those pollutants with a limited half-life that are in the mother's bloodstream. You know, we have some great data showing how many toxins are actually in the cord blood, and it's over 200 on average of a newborn baby. So that baby has not been exposed to our planet yet, except through its mother. And on average, babies have quite a number of, you know, uh, phthalates, pesticides, flame retardants, and other important toxins that are damaging their immune system, their digestive function, their central nervous system, their peripheral nervous system right from the get-go. They're weakening these infants. So if we can reduce that toxic load in the mother prior to conception, we are really helping her infant. So you need to really be an expert in this because as I said, we don't want to freak out our patients to the point of paralysis, but you know, there are resources that we teach in our programs so that you can explain to your patient the best water filter, the best air filter that they can buy depending 
on what's in their water and what's in their air. There's not a one size fits all answer to this question. You know, which ingredients do they need to be looking for in their personal care and cleaning products? They need to know simple, cost-effective alternatives to endocrine disruptors and persistent environmental chemicals that are known to cause harm to infant, child, and maternal health. So once we reduce the toxic load, or instead of reducing the toxic load, why don't we just juice fast, right? If we know mothers-to-be are exposed to all of these chemicals, why not do a liver cleanse, right? Well, here's the problem as I started to mention the process, the biochemical process of detoxification, even just the piece that's only that's in the liver. And that's not the only thing involved in detoxification. Other systems are involved. But if we just look at the liver, as I said, phase one upregulation with juice cleanses, exercise, water fast is not the whole story and can actually, if we look in the middle here, make these intermediary metabolites more toxic than the original toxins we were trying to eliminate. So we've got to completely support phase two of the detoxification pathways. And you can't do that with a juice fast because protein, specific amino acids are required and other very specific chemicals that that interact with the genes that support the enzymes that, that create the enzymes in phase two detoxification. And so we need to be eating a very specific diet, high in elagic acid, genistein some, in some cases, you know, garlic and rosemary and cruciferous vegetables help to support phase two detoxification as well. So we need to be looking at the whole plan and supporting the entire process of detoxification. The details are important. As a clinician, as a wellness professional, you need to understand the complete process of liver detoxification, the micronutrients involved, the antioxidants, how sweating comes into play, how hydration comes into play, protein support, and inducing the right genes and enzymes at the right time. Plus, the process doesn't end with the liver. Is your patient hydrated adequately? Is she constipated? You know, if, if she's mobilizing toxins and even completing the liver detoxification process, but those byproducts and metabolites are not able to be excreted because she's dehydrated or constipated, that is another huge problem. Sleep is essential. Brain autophagy, which is the cleansing of the brain, happens every night during deep restorative sleep. And there are many reasons why preconception women are not sleeping that we'll absolutely get into. So the bottom line for mistake number one is that a preconception juice cleanse is simply not enough. Mistake number two, minimizing the importance of preconception fat loss. And as I said, I don't like to emphasize weight loss and fat loss with my patients. Uh, women have enough stress around body image, enough pressure to lose the baby weight, you know, if you're working with a woman who has secondary infertility like I did. But when a pregnant woman is overweight, she does have increased risks of gestational diabetes, of having to have a cesarean section and the associated complications that can go along with that, of fetal macrosomia, of prolonged or complicated vaginal deliveries. And there are long-term risks to her infant, her child, for being overweight or obese and having type 2 diabetes and other conditions in their adult life. So this is generational. Plus, mothers who are overweight or obese have higher risk of antenatal and postpartum depression. So we need to, it, with a lot of compassion, a lot of support, a lot of evidence, help our women in the preconception phase lose the weight so they can go into pregnancy. First of all, it will help them optimize their fertility. And then once they do get pregnant, to really reduce a lot of significant health risks. 
There are essential strategies and research-based strategies for reducing weight, for, for losing fat. High intensity interval training, for example, is the type of exercise that is the most effective exercise for fat loss. The problem is that a lot of the women you'll be seeing in your practice are going to start off coming to you with HPA axis dysfunction, you know, just like I had, quote unquote, adrenal fatigue. They may have thyroid issues. They may have uh, other hormonal imbalances. The endocrine system is complex and interrelated. We can't separate it into its parts. So if her stress management system maybe is, is not in good balance, which it certainly may not be if she's been uh, struggling through an infertility journey for months or years, or if she has endometriosis, or if she, you know, just has had some emotional or life stress moving, um, you know, uh, loss, a death in the family, a job change, you know, lots of different things can contribute to HPA axis dysfunction. And those women, if we start them on intense, even if they are overweight, if we start them on intense exercise programs, such as, you know, programs that include high intensity interval training, we can actually induce infertility by exercising these women too intensely. And I have seen that over and over and over in my practice. Women who are intense type A go-getters who are, you know, crossfitting and running races and they are, they are inducing infertility because they are worsening their own HPA axis dysfunction. So right size personalized exercise is essential. As a health or wellness professional, you really need to be able to assess each woman, including her endocrine and immune function, to design a personalized fat loss program that will safely reduce pregnancy complication risks and long-term health risks for her infant. Let's dig into mistake number three. So women who are, maybe they are those high intense women and they're exercising a lot and they've got a lot of joint and muscle pain or they're overweight or they have autoimmune disease or they're just fatigued and they have headaches, you know, and they're using over-the-counter pain relievers. Now, while the data is mixed, I believe that this is a very important issue of fully informed consent. We have animal data that shows that inhibitors of the prostaglandin endoperoxide synthase 2, the PTGS2 enzyme, which is also known as the COX-2 enzyme, reduce ovulation rates in women. So non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs that in inhibit these pathways reduce ovulation rates in women. Studies in macaques show that PTGS2 inhibitors can reduce the rates of cumulus expansion, oocyte release, follicular rupture, oocyte nuclear maturation, and even fertilization. These uh, PTGS2 inhibitor reduced, the, these drugs reduced pregnancy rates in breeding macaques when they were administered in the same way that you might administer an emergency contraception. The studies were actually done looking to see if, if using these kinds of drugs could be beneficial as emergency contraception. So if you have a patient who's trying to conceive and she's using a lot of over-the-counter non steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, she may be inadvertently, it, it's, it's a short-term process, but she may be suppressing her ovulation right at the same time she's trying to get pregnant. Now, in a more recent study, so this work was done, uh, well, both of these, these studies were published in two, 2015, so the data available is still mixed, and so it's important to have a complete picture of the data. So this was a, a human study. Th these, these other studies were, some of them were also done in humans, but this other study that was just published in 2015 68% of the women in this study indicated taking over-the-counter analgesics during the study period. They took things like ibuprofen, acetaminophen, aspirin, and naproxen. And analgesic use during the follicular phase, so the first half of the menstrual cycle, was associated with actually decreased odds of sporadic anovulation after adjusting for age, race, body mass index, perceived stress level, and alcohol consumption. So it may not be the case that all 
analgesic, analgesics. Maybe it's just the COX-2 inhibitors or, you know, it may not be that all analgesics negatively impact ovulation, but women need to understand the potential risk and understand that there are herbal, nutritional, exercise, body work. There are lots of other options for pain relief. Let's address the root cause of any pain that your preconception women are experiencing or your women struggling with infertility. And let's address those in ways that do not have ovulation and fertility side effects, or at least the potential for those side effects. All right, mistake number four, just flat out ignoring the vaginal flora, right? Women don't think a lot about their vaginal flora. On a day-to-day -day basis, I don't really think a lot about my vaginal flora, I'll admit. But if I'm trying to get pregnant, I want to be thinking a lot about my vaginal flora. Having healthy vaginal flora supports the transfer of sperm into the uterine cavity and creates a more supportive environment for implantation and actually all the way through to optimal pregnancy outcome. Women who use antibiotics prenatally or who have gut or vaginal dysbiosis may also be negatively influ influencing their fertility. So this was a study that was fascinating. It looked at a more common species of healthy vaginal bacteria, Lactobacillus crispatus, which is an H2O2 producing bacteria. It was used to, that, that bacteria was used to colonize the vaginas of sexually active, healthy women. And when they did that, the success rate of IVF increased significantly to between almost 70 and 90%. This result may support the hypothesis that colonizing the transfer catheter tip with this specific kind of lactobacillus at the time of IVF uh, endo, um, embryo transfer would increase the rates of implantation and even the live birth rate while decreasing the rate of infection. So right now, there, you know, we don't know yet if this is the case, but it looks like using prophylactic antibiotics during this time may have a potentially negative effect on implantation and live birth rate. Previous studies have recommended using broad-spectrum antibiotics for prophylaxis, but by doing so, there's always a risk of diminishing the dominant H2O2 producing lactobacillus species in the reproductive tract. So even if your client is not doing IVF embryo transfers, we want to set up that environment for success. So does she have adequate lactobacillus species in her gut, in, vag in her vagina? Does she, you know, is she walking around with any kind of vaginal dysbiosis, like chronic um, uh, bacterial infections or chronic yeast infections? This needs to be addressed to optimize that environment vaginally for uh, fertility and for optimal pregnancy outcome. All right, and finally, mistake number five, ignoring the micronutrient depletions that are caused by birth control pills and other common drugs. So we know, we have good data that supports that essential micronutrients for conception and for pregnancy are, not, are simply not well absorbed by women who are on oral contraceptives. And again, as I said, up to 80% of women in your practice will have at some time been on oral contraceptives. And these are some of the most important micronutrients that are required for pregnancy. You know, look at this. This is like the definition of a prenatal vitamin, right? Folic acid is essential for preventing neural tube defects in fetuses. Vitamins B2, B6, and B12 are essential to reduce inflammation and homocysteine, which is not even, not just important for fertility and pregnancy, but homocysteine is a primary cardiac risk factor and inflammation may induce obesity, allergy, and asthma risks in that infant, baby, and even later in life as their ch children, adolescents, and adults. Vitamin C and E are also not well absorbed in women on birth control pills. These antioxidants minimize inflammation and may influence the environment for healthy sperm. These nutrients also improve the systemic environment in women with inflammatory conditions such as endometriosis, PCOS, and other inflammatory conditions that impact pregnancy. And millennium, selenium, and zinc, these are essential minerals to deplace heavy metal toxicity, keep the uterus in, uh, relaxed so that there's no preterm labor problems, 
and protect the maternal thyroid, reducing the risk of postpartum thyroiditis. So let's chat through a case study. This is a, a common kind of case that you may see in your practice, and there's so much that can be done to support this woman who is struggling with infertility. So this was one of my patients. She's 34 years old, a mother of a four-year-old son, and she, like me, had secondary infertility. She complained of significant fatigue, chronic joint pain in her neck and hands. She had one miscarriage since the birth of her son, and she was taking ibuprofen most days to control her general joint pain, and she was taking Cymbalta because she had had moderate postpartum depression after her son's birth that never fully resolved. She's on a standard American diet. She has a lot of sugar cravings. She has poor sleep quality, especially before her period. She spends lots of time on her computer at night playing in games or scrolling through Facebook, especially when she has bouts of depression or insomnia. And she's really, at this point, frustrated. I remember her saying, you know, I'm so afraid that my body just no longer works. I had no problem getting pregnant the first time. But now it feels so hard. And so our women, our patients in this situation just feel very vulnerable because they can't figure out why their body, you know, quote unquote, doesn't work. And, you know, having been there, I understand that sentiment. So she decided that she wanted to try a natural approach to fertility before seeing the reproductive endocrinologist that her ob recommended. She has no family history of infertility, but her mother had breast cancer four years ago that she has recovered from, and her father is obese with high blood pressure. Her sister has no children, but does struggle with moderate depression. She was born, the patient herself was born by a cesarean section. She had chronic seasonal allergies as a child. She doesn't really know if she was breastfed. Uh, she also reported, reports having PMS since she started her period at age 13. And so her gynecologist put her on contraceptives, oral contraceptives from ages 15 to 29 to just regulate her periods and reduce menstrual cramping. She cooks at home 70% of the time, uh, you know, eats a lot of pasta and hot dogs and things like that. Uh, she doesn't like fish, but she's not a picky eater. She drinks one coffee per day, and she doesn't drink alcohol. This is where we started. She, when we started, she reported that I never have been a very good sleeper, but my sleep worsened after the birth of my son, and she said that she now has bouts of insomnia, especially before her period. When she can't sleep, her, her MO was to play games on her computer and scroll through Facebook. When we looked at her stress and support, she enjoys being a stay-at-home mom with her son, but she often felt isolated. Her husband worked with long hours, but is supportive, um, but she doesn't have any family living near her, and because of her postpartum depression and her pain and her fatigue, she really hasn't joined a lot of mom activities. Her son goes to a preschool part-time, um, but she just did, was feeling kind of isolated. She occasionally goes walking and taking her son to the park for exercise, but no regular exercise plan. And she reports moderate constipation with some bloating after meals, nothing that was very bothersome to her. She was kind of like, this is how it's always been. You know, if I have a bowel movement every three days or so, I'm happy, right? So this is an, an important assessment tool that I use in my practice with all of my patients because we have to look at that at each woman from a holistic perspective, because her resilience has to do with how rich she is in all of these domains. So let me explain these a bit to you. So her perspective is, you know, is she optimistic that she has some power for this to turn around? Or is she really feeling pretty pessimistic that she'll ever be able to have another baby? That's where we started. Connection, she was in a situation with lots of isolation as a new mom. She had good support from her husband, but not a lot of friends, not a lot of family around. Nourishment, she was having, she was eating a poor diet, lack of hydration, no pleasure. Pleasure is such important nourishment for new moms. I wouldn't say no pleasure. She enjoyed playing with her son and raising her son, and there were days they had really good days, but she wasn't really tapped into kind of what feels juicy to her, you know? Uh, her strength, she was feeling physically weak, in pain, and fatigued most days, and she had been working full-time before she had her son, so she now was feeling very financially dependent on her husband. 
contribution. She'd like to be more present with her family, but she often feels brain foggy. She was missing work, but feeling too tired to even consider trying to find a part-time job. And she was doing the best she could with her son, enjoyed taking him out when she could, but most days she just didn't feel like doing things like that. Her attention, worsening brain fog, still struggling with mild depression, and rest, you know, not very good. I wake up tired and don't sleep well at night. So what we did was I put her on one of our preconception cleanse programs, which is essentially a whole foods anti-inflammatory diet. We shifted coffee for herbal tea. Fitness started with gentle therapeutic yoga with a yoga therapist because she had so much pain and I was suspecting low cortisol, though we didn't do a lot of testing with her. She didn't have a lot of financial resources for that. Um, mindfulness and breath work, circadian rhythm. So whenever someone's got HPA axis dysfunction or depression, I'm immediately thinking, how can we optimize her, her circadian rhythm? Eliminate blue light exposure at night. I call that the laptop curfew, right? Turn off TVs and laptops and phones by 8 p.m. Increase daylight exposure. Sometimes we forget how important it is not just to be exposed to dark, but be exposed to actual sunlight walking, being outside with her son for at least one hour daily, a bedtime routine of Epsom salt baths with lavender at night and light reading. And she began to implement a bi-monthly date night with her husband. And she, what she did was she made one friend at the preschool and exchanged uh, babysitting time with them. And then she decided she was going to learn to cook. That was sort of her passion around this because she realized that if that could be part of her healing, she had time for it. She, her son was old enough to start sort of incorporating him in that. It gave her a little bit of purpose. So she enrolled in a cooking class with another mother from the preschool. She started to reach out a little, make friends with one, you know, kind of open looking mom at a time. Then she eventually hosted a dinner party with, you know, that woman and her husband and her husband and her son and, and you know, the kids. And she began, it was sort of a mission to begin cooking healthfully for her whole family. Fascinatingly, and I also see this all the time, her husband lost 20 pounds in three months, quote unquote, without doing anything, right? Which sometimes for my patients makes them really mad because a lot of times the husband will lose more weight than the wife and she's like doing all this work. But, you know, it's a good side effect overall. After three months, she was eating primarily soaked and sprouted grains and beans with some organic poultry and fish. She actually learned to like some fish once she learned how to cook it. Lots of vegetables, low glycemic fruits, nuts and seeds, and we added probiotic foods and digestive enzymes with each meal. Bone broth at least four times a week to restore the minerals. Started on a very high quality pharmaceutical grade prenatal vitamin plus an omega-3 fatty acid supplement. And she drinks now approximately 60 ounces of water per day. After six months, she began to tolerate more intense exercise. She tolerated pelvic floor safe, uh, high intensity interval training a few times a week, progressed to some more intense yoga and continued with some restorative yoga. So it was like a mini cross training program. After seven months, she had a weight loss of 25 pounds. Now she was back in a healthy range of BMI. She had a much improved relationship with her husband because she was just happier and she had this little purpose around kind of feeding her family and caring for her family and learning creative to be creative in the kitchen. She was much happier with her daily life. She had a few friends, more energy with her son, enjoyed cooking, eating, entertaining, was sleeping through the night most nights. I think that's almost entirely because of, well, maybe the omega-3 fats, but also just change in her light dark exposure and her bedtime routine. She had these three new friends that she met in preschool, the preschool moms. She started to go, you know, walk her son to preschool. She was outside. So she would run into people more. Uh, she enjoyed yoga and, and her YMCA, the HIT instructor at the YMCA was very supportive when we explained what she could and couldn't do. And after nine months, she was pregnant with her second baby. And now we got through the first trimester. She had significant nausea, but she was able to eat small amounts of whole foods. And we'd make kind of healthy crackers and just eating little by little by little and just being patient through that time. It, it went fine. Uh, now she's in the second trimester. Nausea is much better. She has good energy and her pregnancy is looking healthy at this point. 
She eliminated the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, and she has been able to reduce, with the help of her uh, uh, psychiatrist, her dose of Cymbalta. So in conclusion, there's really no silver bullet approach to optimal fertility. There's no one fertility cleanse. There's no one fertility supplement. It is a whole woman approach for women who are either struggling with infertility or who simply want to optimize their preconception and pregnant health. And a lot of times we catch women with that second pregnancy, that third pregnancy. You know, they're so, they got pregnant maybe easily the first time, but they're so depleted from that first pregnancy and everything else. You know, she had a long history of birth control pill use. She had history of, um, lots of allergies at a child. She was struggling with depression. She had a lot of fatigue. So after that first pregnancy, they don't know if they can do it again. So we really have to come at this with a whole woman approach, nutrition, detoxification, hydration, specific personalized supplementation, personalized fitness, community, contribution, perspective, her microbiome, vaginal and gut, and healthy weight. So to learn more, if you're ready to bring this whole woman approach to working with preconception clients in your practice, Lara Adler and I have created the program Optimal Fertility, Preconception, Detoxification and Preparation. It's an online training program for health and wellness professionals. It's taught by myself and Laura Adler. As I said, we deliver not, uh, seven online modules. These are delivered weekly. There's live question and answer sessions. We have extended support through our Facebook community, uh, continuing education credits for nutritionists, and we're constantly adding these for physical therapists and other professions. And you will, ha- you will complete exa- an exam and have a certificate of completion at the end. So, you know, to kind of post a few more uh, certifications on the wall in your office or your virtual office if your practice is online. The topics we'll be covering in a lot of depth, minimizing the environmental toxin load, practical avoidance of toxins, including in personal care products, cleaning products, air water, endocrine disruptors, and so forth. And Laura goes deep into alternatives that are cost-effective and personalized. She also explains how to talk toxins with your clients and patients without inducing fear and paralysis so they don't do anything and don't go outside, right? We also do a deep dive in my modules into preconception detoxification with nutrition and supplementation, specific strategies to upregulate both phase one and phase two liver detox and to support healthy elimination. A deep dive into preconception nourishment. Don't forget how many of your patients have been on birth control pills. About 25% have also been on Uh, antidepressants, many have been on NSAIDs, you know, 80% on birth control pills. There are micronutrient depletions everywhere. And and not all of them are eating, you know, strong nutrient dense diets all the time. So they're not even intaking enough nutrition. So we talk about how to set a strong nutrition foundation, safety and using supplements in the preconception period, because sometimes these women get pregnant and we have to know, are these supplements safe for pregnancy and even in the postpartum phase? We also talk about optimizing the microbiota in the preconception, pregnancy and postpartum periods, health coaching strategies for couples who are trying to conceive. Again, taking a whole woman, whole family approach, starting to think now about what her new mom identity will be. What will it be like when she's maybe not working or not working in the same way or when she has to go back to work and how she'll manage all of that. We're with you for the long term. This is not like your usual online seven-week program where you just get a bunch of recorded webinars and that's it. No, we are going to be giving you evidence-based education, lots of webinars to support you to increase your confidence and effectiveness with this population of patients. A lot of specific training. But in addition to that, you will have our long-term support. This program is more like a membership than a course. You have access to us when you start to use this material in your practice, even if it's months after you finish, you know, learning and taking notes on and listening to the modules. So it's like a membership that you only have to pay for once and you still get us. 
You'll also receive all the research updates and new materials anytime the program is updated. And we include a lot of practical tools in this program that you can use right away. Specific toolkits and 4E cookbooks that you can use right away. You can you know, literally print them off and use them with your patients and clients. And you never again have to question, how can I do this in my setting? So whether you're a health coach, a nutritionist, a physical therapist, a fitness professional, we include toolkits specific to your profession. This program also includes a webinar with my specialist attorney to help answer your scope of practice and other legal questions so you can practice with both integrity and confidence. The cost of this program is $1,297 for the complete package. Again, it's a one-time fee for really a long-term membership. All of the training modules, lifetime access, the private support uh, community, life call, live calls, live Q&A calls, bonus toolkits, the e-cookbooks, and the bonus legal webinar. So thank you so much. We covered five essential and practical strategies that you can use today in your practice. So that is for you to just take. And if you want to go deeper with this material and work with more women in the preconception phase and have support along the way, I invite you to join us in the Optimal Fertility Preconception Detoxification and Preparation Program today. For a limited time, and here is the invitation, the gift that I have for you, you have the opportunity to join us at more than 50% off the regular price. You'll see all the details below this video. I'm offering this program for a very limited time for, six, for just $647. As soon as you register, you'll receive immediate access to your materials and an invitation to our private Facebook group. You'll also have access to our amazing support team who are right there for you if you have any tech questions. You know, we are very experienced. I've been teaching online now for, gosh, at least eight years, nine years, maybe even 10 years. And um, so we are very comfortable with technical newbies. If you feel like you're not sure if you can use this, you're not great with computers, don't worry, you will not be overwhelmed. And if you are, we are here to support you. My support team will get on the phone, they'll screen show with you, you will know how to uh, make this work for you. Thank you again for coming today. It was my absolute pleasure to share this important information with you. I look forward to getting to know you better and to support you to grow your practice, helping more women to overcome infertility and have the healthiest pregnancies possible. So for more information about this program and to grab your more than 50% discount, read on below. Thanks so much. Have a great day.